This programme is sponsored by Mouse Mesh, the humane way of keeping mice out of your home. Air brick covers come in three different colours and sizes, shaping the future of pest control. This film follows my independent investigation into the Jed Allen Didcot murders, sometimes referred to by our disgraceful mainstream media as the Wolverine murders, which took place in May 2015, when an entire family of four ended up dead in the space of just a few hours. As with all my investigations, I am happy to be corrected on any information in the film, and I welcome new information that may shed more light on what really happened. Please send it to me by email if you have such information. I intended to release this film next year, 2017, on DVD as part of my UK national speaking tour, but I have decided to put the information out now onto the internet because I have recently received what I consider to be a death threat as a direct result of my investigation. This threat was unexpected, but the threat itself, in my opinion, has shed some light onto the events. I will come on to that threat later in the film. I will point out here that certain key people who were close to the family have already seen this film and are therefore fully informed on what you are about to see. Also that all of my findings and investigation have been passed to the relevant authorities and this video is now being posted to tens of thousands of people on the internet. In other words, the genie is out of the bottle and it is not possible for anyone to prevent this information from becoming public. So if anything should happen to me in the immediate future, the person who has made the threat and possibly people who are associated with the person who made the threat would become suspects and subject to investigation. People will often make sweeping statements when it is suggested by conspiracy people that the media, the police and the judiciary fail to come to the right verdicts, with statements such as terrorism is not always a conspiracy or you think everything's a conspiracy. Let me state that I do not believe everything is a conspiracy. The criminal justice system deals with around 2 million cases each year and of those, around 85,000 people end up in prison. I would suggest the vast majority of these cases are dealt with in a fair and proper manner, and most of the convictions are probably sound. By selecting the Jed Allen case as one which I felt needed private investigation, I am not claiming that all murders or terrorist type acts are conspiracies, or that everything in the media is a conspiracy. I decided to investigate this case for some very good reasons, which I will spell out in a moment, and after a thorough investigation I have serious doubts about the official story, which I will explain. So no, everything is not a conspiracy, but without question, conspiracies do happen, I would argue, more than most people realise. 
The film you are about to watch does not only expose a possible conspiracy, it also exposes how woefully lacking our mainstream media is in failing to ask any relevant questions, how woefully lacking TV documentary journalism is, and how untransparent our criminal justice system is. As with most of the investigations I cover, there is always a very firmly agreed official story in the media about what is alleged to have happened. This is usually an undisputed narrative put out by the police and then regurgitated by all mainstream media outlets without question. Six months after the four deaths occurred, the official story was reinforced by the verdict of an official inquest and the media regurgitated the same story yet again. So I am going to start by reminding you what the official story is and then describe my own investigation into the case. 21-year-old Jed Allen lived at number 2 Vicarage Road, Didcot, with his mother, 48-year-old Janet Jordan, his stepfather, 44-year-old Philip Howard, and his half-sister, 6-year-old Derren. Jed worked as a gardener and labourer for Oxford Council, a job which he enjoyed. On Saturday afternoon, the 23rd of May 2015, Jed was at home with the rest of his family. He had arrived back at the house at around 2.30pm after having lunch in the Orchard Shopping Centre with his friend Philip Webber. Before lunch, he had trained at the local gym with his friend, who I will refer to as Rob M. So he had been home for around two hours before the events are alleged to have occurred. At about 4.45pm, he is alleged to have murdered all three members of his family with a hunting knife, then left the house just before 5pm, walked to Didcot Railway Station where he caught the 5.24pm train to Oxford. After arriving at Oxford at 5.45pm, he was then seen on CCTV at a few locations in Oxford City Centre between 5.45pm and 6.28pm. He also used a cash point, withdrawing £100. He then started walking in a northeasterly direction towards the Oxford University parks and shortly after 7pm he is alleged to have texted several of his friends and his father to say he had done something bad. Part of his text read, I know what I have done is wrong but I love you all and I will soon be in a better place. I need your help. I need you to call the police. So the official story states that he killed himself at around 10 past 7 after sending these texts. It wasn't until about 8.15pm, a full two and a half hours after the family were murdered, that one of Jed's friends, Lewis Haycroft, worried about the text he had received, went along with his father to Jed Allen's house, where they discovered all three bodies of the family. They called emergency services, who arrived on the scene at 8.33pm, which is almost three hours after the murders are said to have occurred. Two days later, Jed Allen's body was discovered by a dog walker hanging from a tree about a mile and a half north of the city centre in bushes at the edge of a field. The official story concludes that Jed Allen murdered his mother, his baby sister and his stepfather, then two hours later committed suicide by hanging himself from a tree. The inquest could not prove any plausible motive for these murders, but as you shall see later in the film, there could have been quite a clear motive for another perpetrator to murder the whole family. But as with previous films, I will leave possible motives for these crimes until later after I have looked at the evidence. Before I go through my concerns, a word to those of you who are puzzled over how the police could possibly get something that seems so straightforward so wrong. I need to make a few points about the police in general. There are two broad reasons why any such investigation can go monumentally wrong. There is a third reason, but I will leave that till the end of the film. The first reason is down to pure incompetence or laziness, where the police just follow the path of least resistance and plump for the most easy and obvious solution to a crime, which entails the least amount of work. Treating this case as a triple murder followed by a suicide would amount to vastly less work for the police than if it were treated as a possible quadruple murder which was made to look like a triple murder and a suicide. There are many documented cases where incompetence and laziness has led to miscarriages of justice. The other possibility is of police corruption, especially where drugs are involved. As we shall see, two of the people murdered were heroin users 
and whenever drug crime exists, there is always the possibility that some police are in league with, in some way or other, the drug pushers. This might seem strange to those who are not well briefed on how police corruption works, but there are documented cases where police have benefited from the proceeds of drug crime and it is in their interest to ensure certain individuals never get caught. There are even cases where police have arrested low-level drug dealers because of tip-offs given by higher-level dealers. They have arrested the low-level dealer, removed their drugs, given the dealer a caution, then the police have given the drugs back to the high-level dealer to be resold, making more money for the corrupt police officers. In other cases, police officers have been compromised by being blackmailed by high-level drug dealers having been filmed in uncompromising acts. So the police do not always act as they are portrayed in television dramas, where they will do anything to get to the truth. So the second reason why a police investigation might be steered towards a false outcome is down to police corruption. There are other theories about the role of the security services relating to the supply of drugs within society which is outside the scope of this film. Some people claim that security services, such as the CIA in America, actually control the major drug cartels and are directly involved in the supply of drugs. The reasons for this are complex, but if you want further discussion on why government agencies may be involved in the supply networks of illegal drugs, please visit this link. Let's start by spelling out what it was about this case that drew my attention and made me suspicious of the official story. Firstly, nobody witnessed the murders, nobody heard the murders being carried out and nobody reported the murders to the police when they were alleged to have occurred. A 21-year-old man with no training in combat had killed a fit 44-year-old man, a 48-year-old woman and a 6-year-old girl with a single knife and nobody in the neighbourhood heard anything they thought worthy of reporting to the police. The screaming and horror would surely have been immense, and on a busy council estate at 5pm on a Saturday afternoon, how come nobody heard anything serious enough to raise the alarm? This suggested to me the murders may have been premeditated, pre-planned and carried out by a trained person or persons. That is, not the result of a random petty household argument which is what the inquest guessed might have been the case. The victims were said to have had defence wounds. If that's true, they must have all put up some fight. So why did nobody hear anything worth reporting? The second point that drew my attention was the fact that the alleged perpetrator was said to have informed everybody about the murders by text message. Not by a voice message, but by text message. Early on in the investigation, the knowledge available at that time did not necessarily suggest Jed Allen had committed the murders, as there were no witnesses, and using a text message to admit guilt raises the possibility that Jed Allen himself was not the one who was informing everyone of the murders. Just because a message comes from a person's phone is not proof it was sent by the owner of the phone. A text message is an ideal way of fooling somebody that the message is coming from them. So admitting guilt by text set alarm bells off for me. Although the media portrayed Jed Allen as being obsessed with knives and violence, this was completely untrue. In my investigation, I have spoken to his friends and they all describe him as a gentle giant who was not violent in any way. The photographs showing him with knives were being taken in a sort of dark, humorous fashion. It is clear that he and his friends, like typical young adults, were engaged in banter and jokes, some of which involved references to films, but this was not being done as any sort of serious gesture. Also, Jed Allen adored his baby sister and was very protective over her. So the third point I had difficulty with was that he had killed his little sister and his own mother for no reason whatsoever. He had no motive to kill them. The fourth point that raised my interest is the fact that because the perpetrator has allegedly committed suicide, the entire four deaths would be run as a single inquest with no jury and no public examination of the evidence. Whenever the perpetrator of a crime is killed shortly after the crime, Alarm bells should always be raised as to the possibility that the perpetrator is a patsy, 
that is, an innocent person who is being used to take the blame for the crime. It is much easier to get a fake murder involving a patsy through an inquest than it is to get it through a proper trial, because an inquest is not responsible for determining innocence or guilt. We do not have two sides arguing for and against the accused, with a jury deciding whether there is enough evidence to show guilt. Once the perpetrator is dead, our legal system isn't bothered about finding out if a dead person was innocent or guilty. This is a major flaw in our legal system which I believe needs addressing. An inquest is limited to answer the following questions. Who the deceased was, when and where they died, the medical cause of their death and how they came by their death. The coroner cannot in law deal with any other matters. So the coroner cannot say who was guilty of the crimes. So strictly and legally speaking, the murders of Janet Jordan, Derren Jordan and Philip Howard have not been solved and Jed Allen has not been found guilty of committing them. There are other peculiarities which don't seem to make sense which raised further concerns in my mind. For example, why would you get on a train and travel all the way to another town then walk for a mile and a half before committing suicide? During the walk he purchased a bottle of water got £100 out of a cash point, telephoned a friend to catch up with him and say he was looking forward to starting a new job. After the call was received, Jed's friend did not think anything unusual had happened and described the call as a little catch-up. Why would you take £100 out of a cash point just before committing suicide? Incidentally, the £100 was not found on his person. In my opinion, his trip to Oxford was probably for a specific purpose, which I will come on to later, and I also suspect he had no knowledge that his family had been killed as he travelled to Oxford. With all these concerns in my mind, I decided to attend the official inquest in November 2015. I thought at that time, if my suspicions were wrong about there possibly being a different perpetrator or perpetrators, then the inquest would provide me with ample evidence to prove that Jed Allen was the killer. At the inquest, I noticed Janet Jordan's parents, who were a couple probably in their early 70s. I also saw Janet's sister and other family members, and a number of Jed's friends. There were three detectives, but only one spoke. That was Detective Sergeant Ali Driver. A Home Office pathologist also gave evidence. I saw a few journalists taking notes and afterwards tapping their stories into their laptops. <coughs> well, I'm just driving back from the inquest in Oxford of the, the dead cop murders. Now, I was fairly shocked at the start of the inquest to see that firstly there was no jury and only two witnesses gave evidence. One was a detective, and the other one was the pathologist who did the post-mortems. So there was no evidence given from any actual witnesses. Not that there were any witnesses. There was no witnesses to Jed Allen going to the house. There was no witnesses to Jed Allen leaving the house. Um, some incredible things came to light which shed massive doubt on this whole case. So there was no actual physical evidence presented in the court at all. There was just the detective speaking and the pathologist speaking, answering a few questions from the coroner. No photographs, not one photograph put before the court. Just We just had to believe what they said regards the evidence. Before I go through the witnesses I managed to speak to, I'll walk through the notes I took when I attended the official inquest. This is my inquest report. Approximately only 60 attended. There was no jury and the coroner, Darren Salter, described it as an extremely sad and shocking case. He explained that the inquest was only going to determine how, when and where the death occurred and not who was responsible. He said he was not intending to read graphic detail or evidence and that he would read an overview and chronology to aid our understanding. He pointed out that interested persons, for example family members, are entitled to ask questions of the witnesses. But during the entire inquest, no questions were asked by the family. This is quite understandable as I felt that the families were still in shock at what was alleged to have happened. 
I personally found it very frustrating to be sat at this inquest not being allowed to ask questions. There were dozens of questions that I wanted to ask, but I was not an interested party, therefore I was not allowed to ask questions. Incredibly, only two witnesses gave evidence, both of whom were part of the investigation. They were Dr Nicholas Hunt, the pathologist, and Detective Sergeant Ali Driver. The coroner pointed out that Philip Howard, Jed's stepfather, had been to the doctors in February, three months before the attacks, and was in a low mood because at that time he had split up with Janet Jordan. He was prescribed fluoxetine. Some of Janet Jordan's GP notes were read out. She married in 1992 David Allen and had obtained seven CSEs at school. After marrying, she had problems with alcohol, cannabis and heroin and also suffered from depression. In 2000, she was a regular cannabis user. In 2004, she was involved in a child protection order and in 2006, two of her children, Jed's younger brother and sister, were taken into care. In 2006, she had stopped drinking and became pregnant with her fourth child, Darren. The coroner said she was allowed to keep the new baby. On the 6th of May 2015, she was prescribed methadone and had given up alcohol for 10 years, but smoked heroin weekly. She was also on antidepressants. This is an important fact to take note of here, that Janet Jordan smoked heroin every week. Forensic reports revealed that six-year-old Darren had no drugs or alcohol in her blood. Janet had signs of heroin, methadone, benzodiazepine, but no alcohol. It was discovered from Philip Howard's blood results that he had undertaken light use of heroin and a therapeutic dose of methadone and nothing else. All three victims died of multiple stab wounds using the same weapon. In respect of Darren, there was no evidence of previous skeletal trauma or abuse. The coroner went through a list of witnesses who had some sort of contact with the family before the murders. Note that none of these witnesses actually saw what happened. Mary Dennis, a friend of Janet's and neighbour, saw Janet the previous night, Friday the 22nd, and said she had a bad depression that day. Apparently, Janet had made a promise to Jed concerning going to the cinema, but had let him down over this, and Jed was upset over it. She said that Jan and Jed's relationship was otherwise good. She also said that Jed was worried about his mother. This is another point I would like the viewer to bear in mind here. Jed was worried about his mother. Mary Dennis also said that Jed did not like his mother's heroin habit, as it might mean that Darren would be taken into care. She said that Jed looked after his sister. Again, another point to make note of. Jed cared about both his sister and his mother and was worried about his mother's heroin use. The coroner next spoke about Jed's biological father, David Allen. He mentioned an incident which happened when Jed was 10 years old. Apparently, Janet became unconscious and Jed telephoned his dad in tears. After this incident, Jed went to live with his father until the age of 17 and then moved back with his mother. Jed's father's statement agreed with Mary Dennis that Jed and Janet had a good relationship and Jed looked after his sister well. His dad said he was never aggressive, avoided fights, loved his sister and seemed happy at home. He had no reason to harm her. Emma Pritchard was a friend of Philip Howard and the coroner spoke briefly about her, stating that there had been issues in the relationship with Philip and Janet, but that Philip idolised his daughter Derren and took her to school every day. The family had only recently moved to Two Vicarage Road from a different part of Didcot and on the morning of the murders were having new carpets fitted. The coroner stated that the carpet fitter reported to the police that Darren and Philip were in the house that morning and were both in good spirits. The coroner then referred to the text messages between Jed and his friend Aaron Farmer which were exchanged two days before the murders. These stated that Jed had been let down by his mother about going to the cinema and that he had not heard anything yet about a job offer with the council. He is also alleged to have texted to Aaron Farmer that his mother was a junkie and that he was really pissed off over this and that his mother can't keep her life together. Please take note of this point. Jed is not only concerned about his mother's heroin use but he is pissed off about it and also that Jed is sharing knowledge of his mother's heroin use with one of his friends, Aaron Farmer. 
During the late morning and early afternoon on the day of the murders, Jed trained at his local gym with his friend and training partner, Rob M. They finished the gym at 1.45pm, at which point they both got in Rob's car and drove to Rob's house in Didcot. Jed then got out of the car and walked to the Orchard Shopping Centre where he met another friend, Philip Webber, for some lunch. Rob described Jed as a big friendly giant and was normal and happy. I have spoken to Rob at length and Rob told me that when Jed left his house at 1.45pm he was in good spirits. The coroner then mentioned Philip Webber and apparently Jed had told him that his father David Allen was going to pay for him to have driving lessons and that Jed would pay him back. Jed seemed pleased about this. I later found out that the new job Jed had applied for required that he had a driving license. This is why it was so important for him to get driving lessons because it was enabling him to get a permanent job. Philip Webber also commented on Jed's friendly nature. We now come nearer to the time of the murders. I mentioned earlier that nobody heard anything significant enough to report anything to the police. After the murders had been discovered, the police conducted a routine survey of neighbours to check whether anyone had heard or seen anything. Nobody had seen a thing, but two people did report hearing voices coming from the house between 4.30 and 4.40pm. Helen Perkins, who was visiting a nearby house at 4.33pm, reported hearing somebody say, fuck off, get out. Then, at 4.40pm, the next-door neighbour, Mrs Evans, who was in the garden, reported a young girl say, Daddy, Daddy, and then heard her mother comforting her. Mrs Evans also said that she heard mumblings from an adult male voice she did not recognise for four to five seconds from the first floor at the back of the house. Note here that she said a voice she did not recognise. In my investigation, I managed to speak to Mrs Evans' husband and he told me that they knew all the family well enough to recognise them and say hello. So Mrs Evans would have known Jed Allen's voice. I asked Mr Evans if he could confirm with Mrs Evans whether she heard Jed Allen's voice or someone else's voice, but apparently she wasn't sure. After hearing these voices, Mrs Evans started to mow the lawn. None of what she heard was significant enough to think about calling the police. So these noises could have just been normal family life and not the sound of a triple murder with a hunting knife. The coroner then went back to speak about Jed's friend Aaron Farmer. According to the coroner, Farmer claimed that he got in from work at 3.55pm that afternoon and received a text from Jed. They had planned to go to the Prince of Wales pub in Didcot. He then is alleged to have telephoned Jed to ask if he wanted to go to the Subway sandwich shop and then to the pub. Farmer claimed that Jed said he was at home on his bed, but that Jed declined his offer of going to the pub and instead asked Aaron Farmer to come round to Jed's house. Between 5pm and 5.15pm, Aaron Farmer is alleged to have gone to Jed's house, but Farmer said he had to go to the John Radcliffe Hospital because his grandfather had fallen. After visiting the hospital, Aaron Farmer said he then went to the Prince of Wales pub, arriving at 6.25pm. These are important details, and I will state that they are from my notes jotted down at the inquest, and therefore might not be 100% accurate. If the notes are correct, we have a witness who was alleged to have gone round to Jed's house shortly after the murders were committed, but was seemingly diverted away. There was no mention whether Aaron Farmer had knocked at the door or actually made it to the house, just that he instead had to go to John Radcliffe Hospital to see his grandfather. I will come back to Aaron Farmer's statements later in the film. The next important witness the coroner mentioned was Jed's close friend, Jordan D. After Jed had got to Oxford City Centre and had withdrawn £100 cash from the cash point, Jed then starts walking towards the area where his body was found. During this walk, he telephoned his friend Jordan D at 6.37pm. Jordan said that Jed would often walk to clear his head. In this phone call, Jed explained to Jordan that he might be getting a permanent position, i.e. a new job, and it all sounded good. I have spoken to Jordan D personally and he said that the phone call did not seem unusual, and that at the time of the call, he thought it was a little catch-up to discuss what he was up to. 
After the call was made, Jordan D had no inkling that anything unusual had taken place or was to take place. The coroner then went into detail on the final text messages that Jed sent to seven of his friends. This was at 7.04 p.m. The coroner read out the final message, which read something along these lines. I haven't got much time. They know. I am nothing more than worthless. I have done what I have to do. He then mentioned something about the family dog. At peace now. Love you all very much. He then named some of his friends and said goodbye. After this, his concerned friends called him straight back, but Jed's phone went to voicemail. At 7.09pm, he sent a separate text to his father, which simply said, Love you lots. His father is alleged to have said this was unusual. The coroner then went on to speak about the friend that discovered the crime scene, Lewis Haycroft. Haycroft was worried about the unusual text he had received and decided to call his father so they could go around to Jed's house. They got to the house at about 8.15pm and he heard the dog barking, went to the back door and saw a body on the floor with blood everywhere. He knew the body was not Jed because the body had no tattoos. He then went to get his father, who I assume was waiting in the car. His father then went upstairs to discover the other two bodies. The coroner then referred to Detective Sergeant Ali Driver, who was the investigating officer in charge, stating that the murder investigation consisted of two phases, what happened at the house and a separate search for Jed, the suspect. Ali Driver stated that they found no evidence of anyone else involved. On Monday, they found Jed hanged in a wooded area close to Marston Ferry Road, the coroner claiming that all four deaths were fundamentally intertwined. The coroner then mentioned that although Janet Jordan and Philip Howard were in an on-off relationship, that Howard was involved in decorating the house. He then referred to Jed's medical notes, which state that in 2012, Jed had dark thoughts and felt different to others. In August 2012, he failed to attend counselling, was referred to a GP to a mental health trust, but did not go. Note, this was nearly three years previous, and in my investigation, many of Jed's friends have told me that things were looking up for him. The coroner then went through the timeline after the point where Jed leaves the house, mentioning some CCTV evidence filmed in a street in Didcot at two minutes past five. This CCTV was not shown at the inquest and has not been released to the media or the public. The only CCTV evidence that I am aware of is in Oxford after the train journey. The coroner then mentions more CCTV evidence taken at four minutes past five at Didcot station. Again, this CCTV evidence has not been made public. The coroner then mentions that a train ticket for this journey was found in Jed's wallet on his body. Frustratingly, the coroner did not say whether the ticket was a return ticket, which would be highly significant. Despite this, why would he put the ticket in his wallet after the journey if the ticket was only a one-way ticket to Oxford and after just murdering his entire family? The ticket purchase time was 5.10pm. At 5.44pm, the train arrives at Oxford. During the train journey, Jed allegedly writes a note in his phone which is, according to the investigation, his suicide text, which it was said he cut and pasted into the text messages to send to all of his friends shortly after 7pm. I am not aware of how the investigation would know when the note was made, nor was any proof shown of this. The coroner also claimed that he had access to a website entitled How to Kill Yourself, but they could not ascertain the time that he looked at this. At 5.48pm, after getting off the train, the coroner states that he buys a bottle of water which was captured on CCTV at WH Smith's. He then starts walking towards the city centre where he takes £100 out of a cash point at Carfax Tower at 6.11pm. He is then filmed at 6.28pm on CCTV walking along University Parks Road. At 6.37pm, Jed telephoned Jordan D, and then between 7pm and 7.07pm, he sent his final text messages mentioned earlier. There was no more use of the phone from the user after 7.07pm. Having gone through Jed Allen's journey, the coroner then went back to describe the crime scene evidence at 2 Vicarage Road. 
The coroner explained that Martin Whitaker from Forensics described how the small back bedroom contained blood pattern from two females. Where the words I'm sorry were written in blood, an empty knife sheath was found nearby. The blood pattern suggested assaults on the victims. Philip Howard, it was claimed, was discovered with one foot trapped in the bottom rung of ladders and it was said he was decorating immediately before being assaulted and also that he was killed in an upright position downstairs. This suggested to me that Howard was taken by surprise and the murder was not preceded by a petty row as was suggested by the coroner. The coroner then mentioned the notebook that was found on the kitchen worktop with a note which read, I know the truth, I don't want it for me or my family, this is the end, and a smudge of blood. Situated near the back door was a footmark which apparently matched Jed Allen's shoes. Again, no photographs were presented of any of this forensic evidence. The wooden knife handle had a palm print on it and the notebook a finger mark allegedly belonging to Jed Allen. The notebook bloodstains DNA profile matched Jed's blood, but again, how would only Jed's blood be present on the notepad if he had just written a message using victim's blood? The conclusion given by Detective Sergeant Ali Driver was that Jed had difficulties with his mother's heroin use and complained that he funded some of his mum's habit. Note here, this could be a very significant claim by the detective. Not only did Jed assist with his mother's heroin habit, but he was actually buying her heroin for her. He said that Jed was in a normal frame of mind and there were no clues he was going to make these actions. At 4.45pm, there must have been an argument. He doesn't know what it was about. Ali Driver points out that the knife was found embedded in Philip Howard, who was situated downstairs, and the two females situated in the small bedroom upstairs. The coroner then asked about the order in which the murders took place. Ali Driver then states that Philip Howard appears to be the last person attacked because the knife was in him, then goes on to say that this seems unlikely. One would assume Philip was killed first because he was the strongest and most able to defend himself. Ali Driver stated that he does not think the position of the knife means he was the last person killed. This evidence raises the question, which was not raised at the inquest, of there possibly being two perpetrators. The coroner then goes on to say that there is lots of evidence, the palm print on the knife, the footprint, then blood on the notebook and the text, but that there were no witnesses seeing anyone else leaving the house. Note here that no witnesses saw Jed Allen leaving the house either. The coroner then claimed that Jed must have cleaned himself up fixed his bleeding finger, left the house, went to the train and sent the texts. There was no evidence mentioned about whether Jed Allen had changed clothes, no evidence that he had showered. So we must assume that the clothes we see him in here are the clothes he was wearing when he created a bloodbath just an hour earlier. He looks remarkably clean, wouldn't you agree? The coroner then mentioned the £100 cash being withdrawn when he arrives at Oxford and that no sign of the cash was found on his body. The investigation believes he killed himself after the text messages were sent, but his body was not found for a further two days. The coroner then mentioned that Jed had no criminal history at all, no history of violence and a good relationship with his mum and Derren. There were no warning signs and all appeared normal that he had no major problems with Philip, had no violence with Philip, and there was nothing to indicate this could happen. The headmaster of Derren's school stated that she was well adjusted and loved being picked up by Jed. Derren was never a cause for concern. The inquest also heard that Jed was known to be anti-drugs. Please note, this is also important. Jed Allen was against drug use. The coroner asked the detective about the £100 and about whether the police had an explanation for this and where it might have gone, but the police said they had drawn a blank on that. The coroner returned a verdict of unlawful killing for Derren, Janet and Philip, but that it was not for him to attribute criminal responsibility. He said it all appears inexplicable. There appears to be no known reasons and no warnings. The coroner said one could speculate that he was not of sound mind, some dark thoughts and depression. Nonetheless, there was no red flag, no warning signs as to what was to occur.
There are a number of pieces of evidence mentioned which it seems places Jed Allen at the crime scene. But bear in mind, none of this evidence was presented to the inquest. The coroner just read things out. There were no photographs of the crime scene produced. No photographs of the message written in blood on the wall. No notepad or photograph of the notepad. No photograph of the footprint. No photographs of the knife or the knife itself. No DNA evidence was presented and no fingerprint evidence was presented. Now I realise that just because the coroner did not show any evidence doesn't mean it didn't exist. I am not claiming this evidence didn't exist. But we must note here that if somebody else did plan and carry out these murders with the intention of blaming them on Jed Allen, then it is highly likely they would plant some forensic evidence at the crime scene to pin the blame on Allen. So we must ask ourselves when examining the crime scene evidence whether that evidence seems genuine or fabricated. I would argue that all the forensic evidence that was claimed to be at the scene can be brought into question one way or another. Firstly the knife and the fact that the knife had Jed Allen's palm print on it. Jed Allen had posted images on Facebook of his hunting knife, so it was public knowledge what type of knife he owned. Any perpetrators could have purchased an identical knife or knives so that the injuries were consistent with his knife. After the murders had been carried out, they could have retrieved his knife from his bedroom and carefully placed it in the victim without removing any prints already on it. The fact that the knife was embedded in Philip Howard, who was situated near the back door as you enter the house, seems like it may have been planted like this so as to be very clear whose weapon was used. Similarly, the words, I'm sorry, written in blood in Jed's own bedroom. Could these words have been written by somebody else being deliberately placed in Jed Allen's bedroom to point the blame squarely at him? The footprint from one of Jed Allen's shoes could also easily have been planted. There would have been pairs of his shoes in the house to make a print. The shoes could have then been taken and placed on Allen's dead body. The DNA evidence also seems controversial. Jed's DNA from blood was alleged to have been found on a notepad that he was alleged to have written a note on. It was said at the inquest he had a cut finger. But Jed had allegedly just written I'm sorry in victim's blood on his bedroom wall. This means he would have had a lot more victim's blood on his hands than his own blood. So why would the sample from the notepad show only his blood and not victim's blood? At this point, it is worth mentioning that the pathologist, Dr Nicholas Hunt, who carried out all the post-mortems, has somewhat of a reputation for carrying out flawed forensic investigations. Some claim he has been used to fabricate or manipulate evidence in controversial cases. I was quite shocked when I discovered that Nicholas Hunt was the pathologist. Throughout his entire testimony at the inquest, the questions posed and the answers given seemed very sterile. Can you explain to the inquest what is meant by defensive injuries? Yes, sir. Defensive injuries are caused when somebody is trying to defend themselves against an attacker. Did any of the victims have defensive injuries? Yes, sir. They all had defensive injuries. It was like listening to a very carefully prepared script. The Home Office employs some 35 pathologists who work on criminal cases across the UK, so it rather intrigued me that it just so happened to be the highly controversial pathologist Dr Nicholas Hunt who performed the post-mortem on the Iraq weapons inspector David Kelly in 2003 and concluded that he had committed suicide. His findings in the David Kelly case have been challenged by three medical doctors who say Kelly could not possibly have died in the manner described by Nicholas Hunt. Many people believe Dr David Kelly was murdered in order to save further embarrassment to Tony Blair over the false weapons of mass destruction claims. Here is a Daily Mail headline about Nicholas Hunt which states, Kelly doctor cautioned over breaking GMC rules, new cloud over pathologist. So it seems that Dr Nicholas Hunt may have a track record in making murder look like suicide. And I will repeat, none of this forensic crime scene evidence was shown at the inquest. 
The coroner just read from his notes explaining what the evidence consisted of. Okay, I'm here in Didcot and I've checked into this bed and breakfast where I'm here for a couple of nights. So this is going to be my base for the next two days. The, the, the coroner's arrived at this decision uh, by presenting 80 minutes of, of, of um, pronouncements and asking a, a few questions of a detective and the pathologist. So far from satisfied me of the official story. Um, so what I've done is from the inquest um, I've took some detailed notes and I've got some of the key names. These are people, uh, mainly Jed Allen's friends, uh, who um, either spoke to him or t had communication with him on that day either before or after the alleged murders via telephone or text uh, and also a few of um, the parents friends as well uh, and also Jed Allen's father so what I've done exactly as I did in the Derek Bird case I've got my uh, list of witnesses here we've got about 15 key witnesses and as I say none of them are first-hand witnesses the bodies were there for um, over two hours before they were discovered so there was no witness to any of these murders. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do is um, go through them one by one. There's probably about nine or ten witnesses uh, in Didcot itself, which I'll be able to do just by knocking on doors tomorrow morning. And then we'll go wider afield to, um, well, north of Oxford, where Jed Allen's father lives and a few other um, of the parents' friends. Um, we've also got the location where Jed Allen's body was found. We're going to go and film there. I'm W hopeful that these uh, dozen or so witnesses would speak to me and try and fill in the blanks as to where Jed Allen was on that day, when did he go back to the house, was he in the house at 4.45pm or was he lured away from the house before that time. Now what I find strange is that before any of the forensic crime scene evidence had been looked at, the police were claiming that Jed Allen was the only suspect. My name is Chris Ward, I'm a Detective Superintendent of the Thames Valley Police and I'm Head of the Major Crime Unit. Today I'm appealing for the public's help uh, in a murder that we are now investigating in Didcot. Just after 8 o'clock last night, police officers were called to 2 Vicarage Road in Didcot. On entering the premises they have found the bodies of three people. A female who's 46 years old, a male who is 44 years old uh, and sadly a child of 6 years old. In relation to that investigation, we are very keen to speak to Jed Allen. Jed Allen is a suspect in this investigation and it's very important that we find him as quickly as we can. He is described as a white male, he's six foot tall and is of large build. Distinctively, he has a tattoo on his left hand of a spider. And I'm appealing today for the public's help in finding him. Thames Valley Police have a number of searches ongoing in relation to this investigation in the Didcot and Oxfordshire areas. People will see officers uh, highly visible in those areas uh, in, in the hunt for Jed Allen. The other appeal I'm making today is for anybody who has any information about what's happened in that house in the last uh, 24 hours to come forward and speak to the police if they haven't already done so. There's a number of ways in which you can contact Thames Valley Police if you have information. Firstly, if you see Jed Allen, you should phone the police on the emergency number and you should not approach him. If you have other information, particularly in relation to the circumstances of what happened in Vicarage Road in Didcot in the last 24 hours, you can contact Thames Valley Police on 101, quoting URN 465 of the 24th of May. For people that are not happy to speak directly to the police or want to leave information anonymously, you can contact Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 one. Let's move on to CCTV evidence, which was mentioned at the inquest. But surprisingly, little CCTV evidence has actually been released. The first piece is just two single frames showing Jed Allen at Oxford train station buying a bottle of water at WH Smith's at 5.48pm and the second is a short sequence of him walking past the Bodleian Library at 6.20pm. I must point out that vastly more CCTV evidence should be available. There are cameras almost immediately outside Jed Allen's house, cameras at Didcot train station, probably cameras on the train itself, 
cameras at Oxford train station platform and many cameras throughout Oxford itself and all they have shown are two single frames from WH Smith's and a sequence of him walking at 6.20 past Bodleian Library. Incredibly, these two still images from WH Smith's CCTV system have been captured using a mobile phone. The police have not even bothered to extract the video from the system and put out a moving, clear image. Instead, they have just asked the shop to play back the video as we see the video is paused. They have then snapped a picture with a mobile phone of the video screen. Here you can see the edge of the CCTV monitor. They haven't even taken the picture square on. They have taken it at an angle, so we are getting a distorted image. This is why the image quality on these stills is so bad, because the police have not bothered to obtain the first generation images to give to the media. This is very sloppy police work, especially when one bears in mind that Jed Allen was supposedly on the run and the police were using these images to appeal to the public to see if anyone had seen him. Despite this incompetence, just consider that the man in these images has just killed three people with a hunting knife, creating a bloodbath. He seems remarkably clean. The last publicly known footage of Jed Allen was from this camera, where he walks purposefully down the street, then disappears off the bottom of the screen. But there are many more cameras he would have been picked up on in Oxford after this point. It's almost as though the police didn't want the public to know exactly where Jed Allen was going. During my investigations, I have spoken to at least 10 people who knew Jed Allen and who were in communication with him around the time of the murders. Some were a lot more forthcoming than others, so here is what I managed to find. I bumped into Jed's friend Harry Montague in the Prince of Wales pub and spoke to him briefly an articulate young man who was obviously very close to Jed Allen and spoke in absolute highest regard of his friend whom he had known for eight years and said he knew him inside out. He said he finds it difficult to talk about and also expressed total dismay at what had been written in the media about Jed. Harry was not mentioned at the inquest and probably did not have any direct communications with Jed on the day of the murders. The first friend I managed to speak to was Rob M., who was Jed Allen's training partner at the local gym. Rob was five years older than Jed, drove a car and worked in London. After speaking with him, it was clear that he and Jed were fairly dedicated at weight training and followed a strict four sessions per week training routine. I feel that Rob was somewhat of a role model for Jed, very focused and motivated, and he spoke highly of Jed. I asked Rob many questions related to the case but all he could tell me about the day in question was they trained as normal up to 1.45pm, Jed left in good spirits to go for lunch with another friend. I asked him about Jed's relationship with Philip Howard, and he said that he did speak about a few minor issues. For example, he said that Jed would lend Philip Howard small amounts of money, £10 for example, and Howard was slow in paying Jed back. He also said that Howard would occasionally go into Jed's bedroom to tidy up when Jed was out, and this would slightly annoy Jed. But nothing to indicate what was to happen. It sounded like a fairly normal sort of family situation. Rob was visited by various detectives. After leaving Rob's at 1.45pm, Jed walked under the railway line and headed to the south side of Didcot to the shopping centre, where he bumped into his friend Philip Webber and stopped there to have lunch at the Orchard Centre in Sainsbury's. I didn't speak to Philip, but I spoke to his parents. Philip's father told me that Philip recalled that Jed was in a quiet mood that day, but nothing that would indicate what was to happen. Philip's mother said that Jed was a good bloke to Phil and he looked after Phil. After having lunch at around 2.15pm, Philip Webber had no knowledge of where Jed went to next, but we assume he went back home. I then tried to track down Aaron Farmer, who was in contact with Jed by phone and text not long before the murders took place. Uh, now I'm outside the house of another witness, Aaron Farmer. As far as I'm aware, I think this guy is the last person to have communicated with him. I don't think he actually saw Jed Allen, but he communicated with him and it was said that he was lying on his bed in the house, i.e. Uh, Jed Allen was. Now I don't know how uh, Aaron Farmer knows that, but it would be nice to get it from his mouth. Um, 
that he's either spoken to him on the phone or texted him and, and has had some information about Jed Allen's whereabouts. So I'd be very interested to, to speak to him because when he's arrived at Jed's house, supposedly the bodies are in there. So he's has he knocked on the door while the bodies are in there and, and not realised? Um, but it'll be very interesting to know what the exact communication was with Aaron Farmer and Jed Allen. So his house is just up there. I'm going to go try and speak to him. Unfortunately, Aaron Farmer no longer lives at that address. So I'm going to move on to the next one. The next witness I spoke to was the man who discovered the body of Philip Howard after he went to the back door of Jed's house. I've just spoken to Lewis Haycroft, who was the chap who actually discovered uh, the body of Philip Howard. Uh, he, and he said, oh, it's something, you know, you, you wouldn't like to see. Uh, I asked him about the knife. He said, yes, Jed Allen did have a hunting knife and he was thinking about buying another one. And he'd actually discussed that with Lewis Haycroft. Um, he said that he only witnessed the one body, he didn't go in any further, he went to get his father and his father then went into the house. Now his father was in the house but I didn't, I didn't question him, I didn't feel 100% comfortable. But one thing he did say was, he, he said he thought the timing wasn't right. I don't quite know what he uh, meant by that, I didn't really want to um, speak to him for too long. He said he was shocked that he would do something like that, he, he found it difficult to believe. Uh, but he, then he said that, you know, anyone's capable of doing things like that. Um, so he was trying to, I think he was trying to um, sort of uh, justify it or, or explain it uh, to himself. So, he, But he was clearly, um, he, he'd clearly got a, a shock when he's discovered that body. In particular, Lewis Haycroft could not understand the murder of Jed's little sister, Darren. This made no sense to him. Another important witness was Jordan D, the friend that Jed telephoned just minutes before allegedly committing suicide. Right, I've just been to the house of Jordan D. Um, a guy answered the door who I presume was his father and he said he doesn't live here full time, um, he's at university, but uh, that is his address. So I actually had a fairly lengthy conversation with this guy, um, giving him all my reservations. I told him about the inquest and about how short it was and about how little evidence was presented. I then tried contacting Jordan on Facebook, but to no avail. So I went back to his house in June 2016 when I managed to speak to him. Uh, the phone call took place for a number of minutes. He couldn't remember how long and I said, well, was it about five minutes? And uh, he said he didn't remember, but it was a number of minutes. Um, so I've took some notes. Uh, he didn't want to go into specific detail on everything that was said in the phone call. I asked. Um, whether Jed mentioned any of his family. Jed didn't mention any of his family and Jed didn't mention anything that had happened. But at the time, this is an important point, at the time of the phone call, when the phone call ended, Jordan didn't think anything of it. He thought it was just a catch-up. Um, as he described it, uh, another little quick catch-up um, because he hadn't been in touch with Jordan for a period of time. And Jordan felt that the phone call was just a catch up. Jordan came across as a very respectable young man. I mentioned to Jordan D that Jed had called his mother a junkie. This was in a text message to Aaron Farmer. Jordan D seemed surprised at this comment. So I got the feeling that this kind of subject, i.e. drugs, was probably not discussed between Jed and his university friend Jordan. After speaking to a number of Jed's friends, I decided to go and speak to Jed's biological father, David Allen. I recorded my recollection of the conversation on a dictaphone after I spoke to him. Right, I've just spoke to David Allen, Jed's dad, and I've had about a 10 or 15 minute conversation with him. Now, I think he was quite surprised at what I was saying, that Jed might not be um, guilty, but, um, He's, he was definitely not completely closed to the idea. Um, he said, when the police came, he said, I know you're not going to believe this, but Jed wouldn't harm anyone. That's what he said. He was very, very gentle, gentle giant. And I said to him, well, everyone said that, that I've spoken to. And he says, yeah, this, he says, that's true. He says, but he says, you don't know what they put him through, meaning his stepfather and the mother. Uh, you don't know what they put him through. Um, they, they've just pushed him over the edge. Now, uh, 
I, do, I don't think he said that with absolute conviction and he actually said to us look I'd love it if you could prove that he didn't do it but I'm not so sure you can and I said well if, if you want it if, if you want me to do that I, I need the inquest papers uh, because I can get them looked at by a, um, a qualified solicitor I, I, I get the impression that um, what I've what I've said to him is kind of shocked him a bit I don't think he's considered it um, but once I've run it past him he's I think he is open to the idea the other thing I said to David Allen was about how on previous cases or people have told me that the police are often or can be involved in the supply of heroin and that Janet Jordan was a weekly heroin user long term and he acknowledged that he knew that she was a long term heroin user so I said to him well, she would know certain suppliers and if those suppliers were involving the police uh, and Jed was against that then that could be a problem for them and he definitely seemed to see what I was uh, talking about so let's now discuss motives now that we have covered much of the evidence. We saw that neither the inquest nor the police investigation could provide a motive for these crimes. So let's consider an alternative motive. Let's first ask what the purpose might have been for Jed Allen's journey to Oxford. In order to address this question, I am going to point out some clearly established facts. One. Janet Jordan used heroin on a weekly basis. 2. Jed was helping his mother cope with her heroin habit. 3. Jed was buying heroin for his mother, as stated by Detective Sergeant Ali Driver. 4. Jed knew who Janet's heroin supplier was. 5. At least one of Jed's friends, Aaron Farmer, also knew about Janet's heroin use. 6. Street heroin in the UK is priced between 50 and 80 pounds per gram. 7. Jed Allen took 100 pounds out of a cash point in Oxford. 8. He then proceeded to walk towards a secluded space just north of Oxford City Parks. 9. Minutes before arriving at the secluded location, Jed Allen told his friend Jordan D by mobile phone call that he was going somewhere that he could not say where it was. So there was a reason why he could not say where he was going. I am going to propose here that the purpose of Jed's journey was to purchase approximately two grams of heroin for his mother. There are several clues which I have just listed which suggest this might have been the case. When we add into the mix that Jed was annoyed, or pissed off as it was put at the inquest, at his mother's heroin habit, a very clear motive for a quadruple murder comes into play. I am not stating here this is what happened. I am exploring a hypothetical motive which might fit the known circumstances. Jed knew who Janet's heroin suppliers were because he was buying it for her. What if Jed had naively expressed annoyance at Janet's suppliers and perhaps threatened to report them? Remember, he was becoming quite a serious bodybuilder and at the age of 21 was beginning to assert himself as a man. If Jed reported Janet's heroin suppliers to the police, they could face lengthy prison sentences. Is this not a potential motive for murder? But if Janet Jordan's heroin suppliers were to murder Jed, then Janet Jordan and Philip Howard would likely know exactly who the murderers were. So the only way around this would be to murder all three. And because young Darren was witness to the murder of her parents, she would need to be murdered too. The drug suppliers would of course know exactly when Jed was leaving the house to travel to the parks to buy his drugs because they would have set up the deal. So all they would need to do is wait until he had left the house murder the three family members making sure to leave clues pointing to Jed, then drive to the spot where the drug deal was arranged, murder Jed, make it look like a suicide, then use Jed's phone to send the text messages alerting everyone to the fact that he was sorry about the murders and that he was going to commit suicide. This would account for Jed Allen's perfectly normal frame of mind when he called Jordan D 20 minutes before he was killed, when he spoke about getting a new job. Jordan D actually told me, and I quote, things were looking up for the guy. 
So let's take a closer look at Jed Allen's route through Oxford to his eventual resting place. Based on all the available evidence, the red line shows Jed's most likely route after getting off the train from Didcot. He leaves the station at 5.55pm, arrives at the Carfax Tower cash point at 6.11pm, is picked up on Cat Street by CCTV walking past Bodleian Library at 6.20pm then picked up again on University Parks Road at 6.28pm. This footage has not been released. At some point along this road, he must have turned right to go through Oxford University Parks on one of the pathways heading in a northeasterly direction towards his eventual resting place. Whilst on the park footpath, he is a bit bored and decides to telephone his friend Jordan D to tell him he is getting a new job and all is looking good. We don't know his exact route through the park, but he probably ended up on Marsden Brook footpath, as this is the only footpath that links from University Parks Road to a point near where his body was discovered. I estimate that when he telephoned Jordan D at 6.37pm, he was probably walking through the park just before crossing the River Cherwell. I walked along Marston Brook footpath in the direction of the place where Jed's body was discovered and while doing so I looked out for a possible landmark that could have been used as a secluded meeting place for a possible drug transaction. There are two brooks um, in the vicinity near where Jed Allen's body was found. Uh, Peasmore Brook and Marston Brook and there's a footpath which goes around the sports fields Marston Road uh, Sports Ground and that takes you on to um, Marston Brook which is the brook within yards of where Jed Allen's body was found so I should be able to walk um, from here yeah well to the right of me there is the cricket pitch Marston Road Sports Ground so I'll just see if I can get a view of that Okay. And I'm just walking along the edge of it. This is looking back at the brook that I've just walked along towards Oxford. Um, now if I come off the path here through this gap in the trees into this field we can see one of the main landmarks around here. Just come out here and there we go. It's the mobile phone mast. So it's, it's possible to walk to the mast from here. The telephone transmitter is visible from the surrounding footpaths and is also visible from the Marsden Ferry Road. So I headed for the transmitter, which it turned out is about 100 yards from where Jed's body was found. Right below the mobile phone mast. It's not a tetra mast that one, it's just a standard mobile phone mast. So, helicopter up there.
these helicopters circling around in front of us. Oh, hang on, this, I think this might have been it. Yeah, this is it. That's definitely, I recognise that tree. Now, there is a landmark nearby, an obvious landmark, which is the mobile phone mast. So if you did have a, a secret meeting arranged, I'll meet you by the phone mast. An ideal place, I guess. And as I've been as I've been filming here, there's been a helicopter hovering about. I'm filming you, filming me. And this is the hedge here where I think Jed was found. They've just shown you. So let's say he had walked here. Okay, that's 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 the put, footpath over there. That's the Marson Road footpath. So yeah, this you can see there. This is the foot cycle path, but you can get a vehicle in there. You can pull actually pull up on the on the tarmac there. Jed then makes his phone call. He's happy as Larry. He's walking along this path. He decides to ring his mate because he's a bit bored. He says everything's fine, I'm getting a new job. That's what he talks to his friend about. He says he's getting a new job, but he's got to go somewhere that he can't tell his friend where it is. Which is clearly, well not clearly, but in my opinion is probably, or could be, uh, the, the, the place he couldn't tell his friend where he was going was here because he was buying his mother heroin. My bet is on, is on that location next to the telephone transmitter. There's no cameras on it. Um, it's it's a good landmark to meet someone at. Um, as you saw, it's pretty secluded, and it's less than a hundred yards from where he was found. And it's next to where you can get a road vehicle to. So, I think. The perpetrators have been dropped off by a road vehicle um, at that point where the fence is. They've climbed over the fence to go to the telephone transmitter. Jed Allen's walked this way along this path that I'm walking along now. He's met them at about seven. That, that I think, has to be the time they've arranged to meet. 7 p.m. The 7 p.m. Uh, purchase of drugs. They've taken the money and then they've probably just strangled them and then strung them up. Uh... One witness who proved quite difficult to track down was Jed's friend Aaron Farmer. He is the last of Jed's friends I spoke to, but as you shall see now, possibly a key person in unravelling this mystery. Remember the inquest heard that Aaron Farmer communicated with Jed by text and by phone less than an hour before the murders. And also, according to the inquest, he visited Jed's house immediately after the murders. So I was keen to ask him if he had actually knocked on the door and whether he noticed anything unusual at the house. I tried to locate him in December 2015 in Didcot, just after the inquest, but I couldn't find him. So I sent him this message on Facebook. Hi Aaron, good evening. My name is Richard and I was wondering if you could spare some time regarding your late friend Jed. I understand there were arrangements made by you both to meet at his house, although he was not there when you called round. Your input is still massively valid regarding this case. I don't have all the details from your statement. I just want to check in with you because some of the details I have on record from the inquest are inconclusive. Please get in touch so that we can talk it through. Richard. This returned no reply. The following year, in June 2016, I tried to locate him again. 
Aaron Farmer was registered living at a house in Didcot at his previous girlfriend's parents' house in 2014, the year before the murders. At some point before the murders, he split up with his Didcot girlfriend and moved out of her parents' house. He later moved to Wantage, which is about seven miles to the west of Didcot. I tracked him down to a house in Wantage, but he had moved a second time to a different address in Wantage. I was able to find his current address in Wantage, where he was living in a shared house with a number of young people. When I called, he was not home, so I left a business card with my name and a phone number with a message on it asking if he could call me. On my way driving home, I got a call from Aaron Farmer, who seemed very annoyed that I had called. In his first call, the line was breaking up, so I pulled over and parked up so I could call him back. He then called me again, and I had a recorder running and caught the call on tape. Hello, Richard Hall speaking. Ringing me. Hello. Why are you ringing me? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing some research into the, um, the Jed Allen uh, case. I'll tell you again what I've literally done to you. You call me or message me or any of my friends again, this whole shit that you're doing will be stopped. You know where I live, you come anywhere near my house again, I will put an end to this. This has nothing to do with you, this is a very sensitive matter. Now I will tell you politely to fuck off and leave everyone alone, okay? Alright, if you don't want to talk about it, that's not a problem at all. No one okay? Wants to talk about it. You know where I live, come to my house again, I will fucking end you. Now fuck off. Okay, no problem. Bye bye now. Let's make no mistake, this amounts to a serious threat and was in fact the second call he had made where he made an identical statement stating, I will end you. Come to my house again and I will fucking end you. You might think this reaction is understandable under the circumstances, and perhaps it is. Perhaps this is his way of reacting to the sensitivities of losing a close friend. But I noted that none of Jed's other friends reacted like this. Most of them spoke to me. One or two were clearly upset at what had happened. But his reaction was very different and made me curious. So I decided to check over more closely the statements made about him by the coroner at the official inquest. The murders are alleged to have occurred at about 4.45pm. It was stated at the inquest that Aaron Farmer arrived at Jed's house between 5pm and 5.15pm but that he had to go and see his grandfather at the John Radcliffe Hospital because he had had a fall. Jed left the house just before 5pm, so this time frame of Aaron Farmer allegedly going to Jed's house is immediately after Jed has just left the house. Let's also point out on this map where the John Radcliffe Hospital is. Here is Didcot, here is the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford, and here, within one mile of the hospital, is where Jed Allen's body was discovered. The main road, Marston Ferry Road, which runs past the field where Jed was found, also runs within 100 metres of the hospital. Is this just a coincidence? So Aaron Farmer is alleged to have been at or near the first crime scene 15 minutes after the murders, then within a mile of the second potential crime scene, the spot where Jed Allen died, 75 minutes before he is alleged to have died. At the inquest, it was stated that Aaron Farmer had gone from Didcot to the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford, then arrived back in Didcot at the Prince of Wales pub at 6.25pm. As we shall see in a moment, the journey time from Didcot by car to the hospital is 35 minutes. The only way to make the journey in that time period would be by car. So I am assuming Aaron Farmer drove this journey by car. There is an image of him driving a car on Facebook indicating that he probably does drive a car. I decided to drive the same journey myself from Didcot to John Radcliffe Hospital and back to see what the journey time would be starting at 5.15pm on a Saturday afternoon. Quarter past five. Let's see how long... Um See if we can get to the hospital and back by 25 past 6. OK, let's go.
time. I've got my ticket. It's just about a minute to ten to. So it's taken me 35 minutes uh, and I've only just got my ticket. Right, so I'd have to walk a hundred or so, a couple of hundred yards to the casualty department, go in there, work out where I've got to pay this and then get back um, by, well, within another 35 minutes. So as you can see, there's no time to go in the hospital. There's only enough time to get here um, and get back. I went to the pay machine, I've discovered that it's free uh, for up to half an hour. So my ticket should be should get me out of the barrier. Um, but on the way back to the van, I realized what was making that funny noise. Uh, the back of my exhausts come off. But not to worry, it only took me a minute to get that off. So it's now, uh, five two, so I'm going to head off straight away. So it's taken me sort of five or six minutes to sort the ticket thing out, get to get straight back. I'm not going to record the journey on the way back, but well, I'm going to check the watch when I get back to the Prince of Wales. So ticket. Watch this thing, clear the exit, and we're away. Back to dead cut. Some people call it shit cut. Right. After 25 past, so I think it's perfectly feasible for someone to have driven from Didcot and back to the Prince of Wales, which is just on the right here. So this is the pub that Aaron Farmer said he went to after he got back from Oxford, and it is it is the first pub you come to in Didcot when you drive back from Ox Oxford. So there we go two minutes to half past so if I hadn't gone wrong a little bit on the way back I think I would have been here for 25 past so yes there's enough time to get to John Radcliffe Hospital and back by 25 past 6 but no there's not enough time to go and see a injured relative so a question which arises from this is did the police check out Aaron Farmer's alibi that his grandfather had fallen over and been admitted to hospital. Now, if the murders of Janet Jordan, Philip Howard and Derren Jordan took place just 15 minutes after it was claimed at the inquest, i.e. at around 5pm, meaning just after Jed had left the house, does this not place Aaron Farmer near or at the crime scene while the murders are being carried out? A question which arises is this, was Aaron Farmer alone in his car, assuming he drove, when he went to Jed's house? And was he alone in his car, assuming he drove, when he went from Jed's house to Oxford? And I repeat, I am not claiming that Farmer was involved. Did Aaron Farmer drop anybody off on the Marston Ferry Road when he arrived in Oxford at about 5.50pm? Have the police forensically examined Aaron Farmer's vehicle, assuming he has one? I am not claiming in this film that Aaron Farmer is in any way involved, but as you heard in the phone call, I did not get the opportunity to allow Aaron Farmer to explain his version of events. If Aaron Farmer does know what really happened, and was in some way peripherally involved, perhaps he had absolutely no choice in the matter. Perhaps he had been threatened or blackmailed to have a role. Perhaps whoever did carry out the murders needed somebody close to Jed Allen they could use to get access to the house. If Aaron Farmer parked his car, assuming he had one, outside Jed Allen's house at 5pm, it would not have looked out of place. I repeat again, there could be perfectly innocent explanations for Aaron Farmer's movements, but none of this was explored or considered at the inquest. Let's not forget also that we know from the inquest that Aaron Farmer had knowledge of Janet Jordan's heroin use. Did Aaron Farmer also know who was supplying Janet Jordan with her heroin? We saw at the beginning of this film how mainstream media reported this case, regurgitating whatever the police and the inquest came up with, then sensationalising the tragic events by choosing some fantasy character from a film and using it to demonise the alleged killer. How low can you get? 
This really is not what the media should be about. Every person I have spoken to in connection with my investigation have been unanimously disgusted at the way the mainstream media reported this case. The media should be the last hope for truth if an injustice has been orchestrated. The media should question everything that is stated and ask for evidence of any claims made by official sources. They should not place themselves firmly in the camp of the police and the judiciary and they should be impartial. The disgraceful behaviour of our media always makes my job as an independent investigator much harder, making people far more reluctant to talk to me. But perhaps there is a reason why the media reported the case in this way. If I am correct that Jed Allen was innocent and the whole family was murdered by one group, we can speculate who that group might have been. Perhaps it was just a very well-organised drugs gang acting independently who successfully misled the police. But perhaps the conspiracy was at a level higher than that and involved corrupt police officers helping the drugs gang by making sure the evidence pointed to Jed Allen. My money is on the group being even higher than the police, probably with an intelligence agency. There are past cases where people involved in illegal drugs and who have been recruited by MI5 have ended up murdered. The Christopher McGrory case from 1997 is one. McGrory was a drug trafficker but had been working for MI5. After telling friends he believed his life to be in grave danger, he was later found in the back of a van murdered by strangulation. His murder is still unsolved and some people suspect security services involvement. What a lot of people don't realise is that MI5 have control over three very important entities, all of which featured in the Jed Allen case. They have the authority over the police, they manipulate the media and they influence the judiciary. I would argue that all three have probably been manipulated in the Jed Allen case. The media manipulated to demonise the Patsy perpetrator, to make sure the perpetrator is portrayed as a real murderer. The judiciary manipulated to appoint Dr Nicholas Hunt, the pathologist that is claimed can turn murder into suicide. And the police manipulated to run the investigation as an exercise in ticking boxes, following the path of least resistance and lapping up planted evidence. There is also the ruthless nature and the efficiency of these killings, which again suggest a more professional high-level hit. I personally suspect the perpetrator had some sort of weapon that could knock someone unconscious or disable them without leaving a mark on the body and the killing is done after the person is disabled. This is just an opinion, however, and is open to debate. Of the ten or so people I have spoken to who were directly linked to Jed Allen, all more or less believed the official story, but all of them, apart from Aaron Farmer, listened to what I had to say and did not strongly refute my suggestion that Jed might be innocent. They all seemed curious about my information. I would conclude from this that there is at least some doubt in most people's minds of those who were connected to Jed Allen. Before I finish, I will mention a documentary that appeared on the CBS reality channel presented by Donald McIntyre, which featured this case. The series of documentaries was entitled Murderers and Their Mothers and looked at the supposed psychology of Jed Allen through his childhood and relationships attempting to explain what may have led to the 21-year-old murdering his entire family, then killing himself. I have never seen such an overly assumptive documentary, which allowed so-called psychologists to spout their theories on the psychology of four people who are now dead, whom they have never met, whom they have never interviewed, and whom they did not know from Adam. Here are a few extracts. Mark Crane, on record, said that she was a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde character, great mother, until the booze got into her and then she was deadly. And I think if he found that stressful and he, he's had experience of the wars and everything else, then for a young boy, eight-year-old, this must be incredibly difficult. In children who are traumatised, who see, are exposed to things they shouldn't be at a young age, a violent 
adulthood, uh, a more aggressive or passive-aggressive adulthood, is a normal response to having bottled up that psychological trauma at a younger age. The level of trauma that Jed is witnessing on, on a daily basis is becoming more serious. And that places quite a lot of pressure on a, a young person of, of this age. So, so he's feeling helpless. He's learning to, to feel helpless on a regular basis. Being helpless and not being able to control his situation is becoming a normality for him. Wolverine is a bit of a good and bad cop. He's good sometimes, bad others. Um, and that may have influ influenced him to think that sometimes you've got to be bad to get a good end, and the, the end justifies the means. I think he killed his mother and stepfather out of anger and frustration, but I think he then killed his sister because he didn't want her to live in care and not have her mother or father or indeed Alan in her life. So it's a very rare mixture of explosive anger and then a misguided mercy killing. Jed Allen was in fact quite a caring person, a gentle giant who would lend his own stepfather money. How many 21-year-olds do you know who would do that? He protected his younger sister, Darren, and cared about his mother and tried his best to help his mother out of a highly damaging drug habit. Jed Allen was a good person who had seen his brother and sister taken into care through no fault of his own and was adamant to ensure that his only remaining sibling, who he adored and protected, would remain part of the family. He was working hard to make a career for himself in a respectable job, a job which involved considerable amounts of labour, sweeping leaves, digging ditches, planting trees and tending lawns. He was saving up for driving lessons, not so he could impress people with a car, but so he could drive a van and therefore better his career prospects to perhaps one day have a family. While at the same time he was doing all this, he tried to help those around him, including his family and his friends, such as Philip Webber, whose parents praised Jed Allen for his attitude towards their son. Several of his friends told me, including Harry Montague, that he was the sort of person that would help anyone. He had a good soul and was not a murderer, and I do not believe he murdered his own family. Okay, I'm back in Wales and just returned from my trip to Didcot. Now, I think I've got enough information now to make a film about this, which I'm going to do in the next couple of weeks. So this film is going to have the hypothesis that Jed Allen did not kill himself and that Jed Allen did not kill his family. And if that is true, it means that there is a murderer or murderers still at large. And um, Hopefully this will persuade Jed Allen's father to let me see the inquest papers, which I know that he has. Um, he said he had a lot of information being given to him by the police or, or the coroner, uh, detailed photographs that may well contain witness statements, witness statements from Jed Allen's friends, possibly including Aaron Farmer. Uh, do those inquest papers show whether Aaron Farmer's alibi has been checked that his grandfather went to John Radcliffe Hospital. Did they check that? This program is sponsored by Mouse Mesh. If you're in the construction industry, we've introduced Mouse Mesh, inbuilt with interchangeable fronts, six different colours and stainless steel.